We're moving on to the Fitzgerald stories, and I just want to make an announcement um, about a possible uh, field trip to New York City. Uh, Mouvet Emre, one of the teaching fellows, um, is uh, organizing uh, a trip uh, to see the uh, uh, production uh, of uh, on The Sun Also Rises, uh, which is another novel by Hemingway. It's by the select, it's by the elevated, uh, what, is, what is the group called? Uh, express elevator service. Um, so um, it's, it's very interesting. They last year they did the Great Gatsby. Um, so it's uh, it was right here, um, and at the Yale Rep. Uh, so it's a very interesting group, and it looks like they're going to keep on doing this extended readings, but also dramatic readings uh, of the novel. So if you guys would like to go to see the sun also rises, just email email movie. Um, and um, I should, I'm just going to get started on the Fitzgerald stories. Um, and we might be under the misimpression um, from reading these short stories that maybe Fitzgerald went to Yale. Um, he didn't. <laughs> he, uh, he was Princeton class of 1917. Um, and this is actually a kind of very interesting that I found from the Princeton Library. Um, that's the um, a kind of receipt that he had at the Triangle Club, uh, and because so many of his short stories have to do with clubs, the Yale Club, and so on, um, it's interesting just to have this document showing that he was a member of the Triangle Club. Um, and this is a letter that he wrote to his classmate, also Princeton uh, 1917, uh, Laszlo Fowler, who would go on to become a very prominent uh, New York lawyer, the founder. Um, of a very prominent law firm. This is what he wrote to Ludlow Fowler. I have written a 15,000 word story about you called The Rich Boy. It is in a large measure the story of your life, toned down here and there and simplified. Also, many gaps had to come out of my imagination. It is frank, unsparing, but sympathetic. And I think you will like it. <laughs> it's astonishing that he should think so. That anyone would actually like this story that is supposedly based on their lives. Uh, but in any case, this is what authors sometimes think um, about their own work. Um, so, you know, I, I think we know just from our edition in, in the short stories um, that there were um, a couple of episodes that Ludlow Fowler made Fitzgerald uh, take out. Uh, they are reinserted now in brackets, but obviously there was historical proof that Ludlow Fowler was pretty upset by the story. Um, but in any case, Fitzgerald really thought that this was a story about a friend of his um, and that the friendship was actually what <coughs> propelled him into writing the story. Um, so he is also in that story that he lays out uh, his theory about fiction and especially the way that characters are to be described in fiction. So here's Fitzgerald, begin with an individual and before you know it, you find that you have created a type. Begin with a type and you find that you have created nothing. There are no types, no plurals. There is a rich boy and this is his and not his brother's story. All my life, I have lived among his brothers, but this one has been my friend. So still saying in, within the story itself that this is um, about someone um, who he still calls his friend. This is his theory. Let's see what Fitzgerald does in practice, because we know that quite often there's a distance between what authors profess they're, they're doing and what they actually end up doing. So this is his practice right on the next page. Let me tell you about the very rich. They are different from you and me. They possess and enjoy early, and it does something to them, makes them soft where we are hot and cynical where we are trustful in a way that unless you were born rich, it is very difficult to understand. They think deep, in their hearts that they are better than we are because we had to discover the compensations and refuges of life for ourselves. Even 
when they enter deep into our world or sink below us, they still think that they are better than we are. So let's say a couple of things here. First, obviously, is that Fitzgerald is using a type, a social label. He's, t he's turning a rich boy into a social type and generalizing about this entire social type. So in many ways, he is doing exactly what he says writers should never do, proceeding with a type. But I think that we should also say that given the fact that he is using a type, that the rich boy is a kind of generic identity uh, that he honors, that he uh, recognizes as a reality, that even though he is doing that, um, his, the contents that he attributes to that type actually are pretty interesting. Uh, according to him, a rich boy or the rich are people who are different from people who are not rich because of two things, right? That they are soft where we are hot <coughs> and that they are cynical where we are trustful. Those two actually pull in two different directions. If we were just to take the first one, that they are soft where we are hot, that's very, very understandable. That because they didn't have to struggle all that much, they don't have the kind of hardihood that comes to people when they have to struggle a lot just to get the bare essentials from life. Um, so that would be completely understandable. But what is interesting is that right after that comes a statement that completely is on the other side of the spectrum. That whereas the rest of us are trustful, the rich actually are cynical. So how could this be? Under what circumstances would the rest of us be trustful, whereas the rich would be cynical? This is not so self-evident. It is something that Fitzgerald would just throw out as kind of a generalization, um, seemingly you know, just something that he would make a casual point that he would make. Um, but actually, it's quite puzzling. So we have to figure out, in the course of the story, The Rich Boy, why it is that even though they are soft most of the times, there are also moments when they are actually harder than we are. They are more cynical than the rest of us. Um, so in any case, so all we can say at this point is that even though, yes, Fitzgerald uses social types in his stories, um, that he has a very interesting understanding of those social types. So we can say that he's really not so much subscribing to the notion of social types as playing with them, putting pressure on them, uh, looking at all the possible permutations of social types. So this is um, something that we've already talked about a little bit last week when we talked about to have and have not, and Hemingway's use of those two types have and have not. So today I want to go back a little bit and give you in many ways the sort of the genealogy to that kind of thinking, thinking in terms of social types. And it actually goes back to the mid 19th century. This is a very um, famous text, scientific text, what aspires to be a scientific text uh, by Josiah Knott and George Glidden uh, called Types of Mankind. And if you guys are fans of Stephen, Stephen Jay Gould, you'll see that this uh, this text is actually mentioned by Stephen Jay Gould in his book, Mismeasure of Man. This is where I got my information from. So in 1854, um, the understanding, there's a clear correlation, obviously, um, between the, the, the facial features of a Caucasian person, very Greek-looking person, classical profile, um, and this kind of very flat um, facial structure. Uh, bone structure of the face, um, the skull corresponds to the facial features. And then, obviously, the implication is that blacks and gorillas actually have the same skull formation. So you can, we can see where this is heading. This is the sort of science um, that is quite common um, in the mid-19th century, uh, talking about social types in order to suggest a very close kinship between certain types of humans and certain types of animals. That's the impetus behind that kind of um, taxonomic thinking. Um, so this was in the um, mid-19th century, um, and by the 
20th century that pretty much has receded into the background. So let's look at another kind of thinking about types. Um, and as we can see from this very sober looking, um, no thrills, no nonsense look of the treatise. Uh, this is a very highly respected sociological treatise by Burgess, E.W. Burgess and Robert Ezra Park um, called Introduction to the Science of Sociology. And it turns out that social types, the notion of social types, is crucial to the birth of sociology. <coughs> so this is what Robert E. Park says. I did not see how we could have anything like scientific research unless we had a system of classification and a frame of reference into which we could sort out and describe in general terms the things we were attempting to investigate. So a system of <coughs> classification and a frame of reference into which we should sort out and describe in general terms. Obviously, there's a degree of abstraction going on, a degree of generalization going on. We need to be able to generalize from individual cases in order to create a system of classification. So in many ways, that's the very foundation of the science called sociology. Um, and Fitzgerald is very much, uh, and Hemingway as well, um, they were both very much moving in that kind of, you know, um, very per pervasive, very common um, intellectual climate. So um, I want to stop here for a brief moment and talk a little bit about the interconnections um, among the texts that we've read so far. Um, as you guys recognize, um, in last week when we were talking about to have and have not, we are talking about Harry Morgan um, as a kind of a tension, the character is a tension between a type, between a label of generic type um, and deviation from type. And we mentioned that in fact it's only when he is mediated through the presence of other people, when he's channeled through Marie or when he's contrasted with Robert Gordon, um, that he actually becomes somebody who's not the social type. So that's Hemingway thinking um, about types. I also want to go back a little bit further and refresh your memory about The Sound and the Fury. Um, in The Sound and the Fury, we talk a lot about the relation between today and tomorrow. Uh, obviously, time is central to the, time, to the Sound and the Fury. Um, and we were talking about Benji, Quentin's, and Jason's tomorrow as one of the most important things linking the three brothers. So today what I'd like to do is to combine those two um, analytic structures um, to create a new structure to talk about Fitzgerald's short stories. We'll be talking about type and variation, but mapped onto the concept of the relation between today and tomorrow. So if you belong to a certain type, if you can be labeled by a generic identity, what is the possible future for you? What is the possible tomorrow for you? So basically a combination of Hemingway and Faulkner. Um, but I also want to introduce a new layer, uh, a new analytic layer into our discussion, which is the difference between a story that is dramatic and a story that is not dramatic. And the four stories um, that we're, we're reading today um, represent very interesting permutations um, on that platform. Um, so we'll be talking about that too. And this is um, just a very quick run through uh, of the argument that I'll try to make today. Um, Rich Boy is about excessive conformity to type. Tomorrow is going to be exactly like today, and so it's not dramatic. Babylon Revisited is, is in many ways a kind of rewriting of Rich Boy of Rich Boy um, is uh, about someone who conforms to type to a large extent, but not entirely, and what happens uh, when that's the case. And so tomorrow is not quite like today, but still it's not a dramatic um, story. And then we move on to two stories that are very dramatic. Um, Diamond as big as the wrist, as we know from the title, is large scale drama, it's very, very dramatic. Um, and then Bernice bobs her hair, small scale drama, but also dramatic. So, um, but let's move, look, take a closer look at Rich Boy. Um, and even though 
uh, Fitzgerald went to Princeton. For some reason, Yale is the reference point for him. So the Yale Club um, is a social marker. And it's very interesting that actually Fitzgerald um, makes the point that um, the Lancer Hunter actually was not popular when he was at Yale. So he, Fitzgerald is making a distinction between Yale College in New Haven and the Yale Club in New York City. And he's really talking about the Yale Club in New York City and not so much Yale College. Um, so uh, Anson is devoted to the Yale Club. He's always there. But there's also the sense that maybe it's too much of a good thing. And so there's the possibility that excessive conformity to type is the Yale Club type, that being too much of that would actually lead to some kind of deviation. So, but first of all, this is the devotion to the Yale Club. Um, but he never abandoned the Yale Club. He was a figure there, a personality, and a tendency of his class, who were now seven years out of college, to drift away to more sober haunts, was checked by his presence. So this is a very unremarkable sentence in many ways. You know, it's not something that we would know. It's very matter of fact. It's very neutrally descriptive. Um, he's a pillar of the Yale Club, um, and his presence there uh, um, is, is an anchor for other people. So they stick around because of him. So there's really nothing to say one way or another, really, about this description of Anson Hunter, other than the fact that it's a little odd, the seven years out of college, that the Yale Club is still this very center of his universe. Um, so it's just beginning to look a little odd, but the description in itself is not especially dramatic or noticeable, really. Um, but uh, more towards the middle of the story, in fact, um, after some things have happened, we know that he missed his chance to marry Holler. Um, he misses his chance to marry Dolly. Um, his life seems to be um, a catalog now of things that are not done, things that he could have done that he chooses not to do or that he perversely allows not to happen. Um, it's beginning to look that way. Um, and it is at this moment that the excessive devotion to the Yale Club becomes almost a summary of what kind of a person he is. It was a hot Friday afternoon in May. And as he walked from the pier, he realized that Saturday closing had begun. And he was free until Monday morning. Go where, he asked himself. The Yale Club, of course. Bridge until dinner. Then four or five raw cocktails in somebody's room and a pleasant, confused evening. It's still quite neutral. Um, it's not registering any shock um, about this non-turn of events. Basically, nothing happens in Anderson's life. Like, you know, so all these things that could have happened, that would have been a significant development in his life, significant turning points, all those important <coughs> turning points were roads not taken by Anson. Um, and so he's still going to the Yale Club. But at this point, going to the Yale Club becomes a measure of the poverty of his life. Right? Before, it had been a tribute to the fact that he's such um, an important presence, that he's a pillar of the Yale Club. Um, now he's going there because he doesn't have anything else. So it's a description from being a plus in his life, something that he has you know, on his resume, that he's such an important figure at the Yale Club, from being a plus um, on his resume. It becomes uh, not exactly a minus, but a sign that things are just starting not to go well for him, or that we're beginning to, think, to see that some things are beginning to go wrong. So it's the indication um, of, 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 of a life that is not taking shape as it should. Um, and the story really is about the possible shapes of one's life. Um, if Anson had married Paula, it would have taken a very, very different shape. It's the fact that he doesn't allow his life to take that shape, that it retains the original shape 
uh, which I guess is good in one sense. It wasn't such a bad shape to begin with. Um, but the fact remains that there's absolutely no change in his life, that tomorrow is going to be exactly like yesterday and like today. So um, this is the very end of the story. Um, and this is on a boat. Um, and the narrator is um, actually happy that the things have, um, that this is how things stand for Anson. And he told me about a girl in the Red Tam and his adventures with her, making them all bizarre and amusing, as he had a way of doing. And I was glad that he was himself again, or at least the self that I knew, and with which I felt at home. I don't think he was ever happy unless someone was in love with him, responding to him like filings to a magnet, helping him to explain himself, promising him something. What it was, I do not know. Perhaps they promised that there would always be women in the world who would spend the highest, freshest, rarest hours to nurse that superiority he cherished in his heart. So it is in many ways a portrait of a social type. Uh, it really comes back to that you know, it's a sort of recognizable social profile. Um, someone who, uh, because he has such a large and guarantee and very, very secure income, he's very, very successful in his firm, um, and he's the pillar of his, the head of his family, um, because so many things are a given in his life. What is also a given is the understanding that there would always be a supply of women who would gravitate towards him and be bowled over by him. People are still bowled over by him if they just see him for the first time. Um, and it's that capacity, that knowledge, that certainty, that there would always be women who will be bowled over by him that makes him what he is. Um, so Fitzgerald's definition of the rich boy extends far beyond the amount of money that Anson Hunter has, um, even though that is not an unimportant consideration. Uh, but it really is, in many ways, the starting point for a whole kind of psychological profile about what it means when someone takes a lot of things for granted. Um, and the ways in which taking so many things for granted can actually be a kind of psychological liability. Um, it's actually not good for us, according to Fitzgerald, um, to be able to take so many things for granted, especially to be able to take other human beings for granted. Um, and that is exactly uh, the, 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 the kind of the, the, the most fundamental truth um, about Anson Hunter. So it is about social type, there's no question about it, um, but this the paradox um, that that he, that he becomes almost kind of an extreme test case of the very of a very recognizable social profile. Um, just to show uh, what a range um, Fitzgerald has, um, and the way that he can start at almost exactly the same uh, starting point, um, but end up in a different place. Um, I thought that maybe we should uh, look at Babylon revisited. Um, it's also about a rich man, um, someone who's never eaten in a cheap restaurant in Paris. Um, I mean, I think that, that really is the raising the bar very hard, right? You know, it's not like we go to Paris every day. Um, but uh, not never to have eaten in a cheap restaurant in Paris. So that is the, that is the threshold uh, for, um, for Charlie. Um, and it would be all too easy uh, to uh, suggest, OK, here's another rich boy and this kind of conformity mm -hmm. to type. Um, what is also interesting about Charlie is that he has in common with Anson in the fact that they both are hot drinkers, right? So four or five martinis is really nothing. It's just the norm, just the beginning, really. Um, so the hot drinking, the taking things for granted, um, the sort of lack of variety in the experience, um, that all of those things they have in common because they are so rich. Um, all of those things they, they have in common. But what is interesting about Charlie is that, in fact, his life has a very, very different trajectory from that of Anson's. And it is actually a happy ending. So let's see what happens 
at the very end of, um, of, of, of Charlie's story, uh, Babylon Revisited, he went back to his table. His whiskey glass was empty, but he shook his head when Alex looked at it questioningly. There wasn't much he could do now, except send Onaria some things. He would send her a lot of things tomorrow. No, no more, he said to another waiter. What do I owe you? He would come back someday. They couldn't make him pay forever. But he wanted his child, and nothing was much good now beside that fact. He wasn't young anymore, with a lot of nice thoughts and dreams to have by himself. He was absolutely sure Helen wouldn't have wanted him to be so alone. So right here, we can see a lot of very, very important differences between Charlie and Anson. The first thing we notice is that this is someone who stopped drinking, right? You know, who has, I mean, that is such an obvious fact that it's almost embarrassing to point out, but there it is. It is very important for Fitzgerald, who had a problem with alcohol, alcoholism, um, that that should be the case, that this person um, has enough self-control um, to say no uh, when it would have been so easy to say yes. Um, but more than that, that, that is actually just the manifestation of something being different is that he has one very important person in his life. And what is interesting is that this is actually not a romantic interest, right? So this is what is missing in Anson Hunter's life is a child. Um, and we know that Fitzgerald himself had said many things about his daughter, Scotty, um, that it broke his heart to think that when Scotty grew up, that his novels would no longer be in print, right? He said that about The Great Gatsby. So we do know that, that Fitzgerald had a personal knowledge of what it means to have a child and to think about the future in terms of the future of that child and wanting to share a future with that child. I think that that actually is what gives him a future. So we're actually very close to the world of Hemingway uh, of to have and have not, which is the future appearing by virtue of the mediation of someone else. In this case, it is not Harry's wife, Marie, who enables that future and uh, an affirmative future to take shape. It is not his wife, but his daughter on the area. Um, so his future is defined in terms of today, I'm going to give her some things. Tomorrow, I'm going to give her a lot more things. It's the pleasure of being able to give his daughter a lot of presents. That is what makes him work hard. You know, he's very, very good at his job. He's making tons of money. He's very, very uh, trusted by his employers. Um, it is all of that is giving him a certain kind of relation to time. So. In, in that way, I think that both Hemingway and Faulkner are sort of implicitly present in the story, is how do we get to have, to stop being a social type? And how do we get to have a personal and a highly interestingly populated relation to the future? The future is not any good unless it is populated by something. And in this case, Charlie's future is very much populated by his daughter. And that is because of the way it is populated that he wants to get to that future. Right? You know, if it's not populated, you might not even want to go there. You might want just to stay where you are. But if it's populated in such an interesting way, he does want to go there, and he wants to go there with her. So this is the, the, the main difference um, between Charlie and Anson. And what is also interesting is that he enables, it enables him to think about his wife, Helen, um, that, who died, who's uh, in very difficult circumstances when they were reconciled, but not really. Uh, it was not a good marriage. Um, it was through the mediation of his daughter that he's able to think about his wife, whom he had probably wronged in some sense, but she's dead now. There's no way for him to right that wrong. So the only way he can right that wrong that otherwise would have been permanent is once again through the mediation of his daughter. So a mediated personal identity and a mediated relation to the future. Um, 
And um, so these are the two stories, but I should say um, that um, they have a lot in common in the sense, that in, in terms of the narrative structure of the stories, um, because even though it's a happy ending uh, for Charlie, because mm -hmm. the future is going to happen so slowly, it's, it's a kind of very um, slow happening, slow pace, incremental emergence of tomorrow, right? He's going to give money to his sister-in-law, that's the implication, that's how he would get his daughter back. He's going to pay for everything to get his daughter back. He's going to give his daughter lots and lots of presents. So all of that is going to happen one day after another. There's not going to be a kind of dramatic change in his life. It's strictly incremental. But because it is steadily incremental, we know that his distant future would actually be significantly different from the today. Um, but neither of those stories, would I say, um, neither is, is really dramatic. So uh, let's turn now to the other side of the narrative spectrum. Two stories are very, very dramatic. Um, and one advertising the drama in the title, Diamond as Big as the Ritz. Um, so we don't, this is probably the most famous short story by Fitzgerald. Um, and I would encourage you to say, to discuss in section whether or not that is indeed your favorite story. Um, it is certainly very, very uh, unforgettable. So this off the charts deviation from an extreme type the rich boy um, and drama on large scale, obviously. The catastrophe at the end of the story tomorrow is going to be different from today. But let's just look at the way Fitzgerald proceeds to talk about this very, very extravagant world um, that really, truly is nothing like the world as we know it. St. Midas School is half an hour from Boston in a Rose Pierce motor car. The actual distance will never be known, for no one except John T. Unger had ever arrived there safe in the Rose Piers, and probably no one will ever. Again, this is on the same page as never having eaten in a cheap restaurant in Paris. Um, but uh, so that is the norm. The norm itself is very, very extreme. Right? This is a school, it's the most expensive boarding school in the world. Um, and it's unheard of for anyone to go there and not only a Rose Royce or Rose Pierce. Um, so that is the baseline, a very, very high threshold. But even on that very high threshold, <laughs> Percy is still a deviation. So it's definitely a deviation um, from an extreme type. And one measure of that deviation is the kind of car owned by the family. Uh, so when they got to Montana, uh, John uh, sees that there's this kind of luminous disc that's coming at him. Um, he has no idea what that is. Then, as they came closer, John saw that it was the tail light of an immense automobile, larger and more magnificent than anything he had ever seen. Its body was of gleaming metal, richer than nickel and lighter than silver. And the hubs of the wheels were studded with iridescent geometric figures of green and yellow. John did not dare to guess whether they were glass or jewel. Um, I just want to stop for a moment and um, talk about a paper, possible paper topic um, that would be perfect for a paper that is 10 pages, um, which is the automobile in Fitzgerald and Faulkner. Right? We know that um, Jason can smell, stand the smell of gasoline, um, that he has terrible headaches uh, because of his relation to the gasoline. Um, so it's a very interesting take on cars on Faulkner's part. And we know that uh, Fitzgerald uh, certainly dramatizes uh, and turns the Gatsby's Rolls Royce into a kind of a surreal car, um, a kind of a mythic car. And here, he's coming back to that. So using the car is a very, very concrete point of entry. We can actually talk about very large structures um, in both Faulkner and Fitzgerald. To what extent is the Rolls Royce an emblem of, um, of, 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 of Gatsby? We also know that they saw another car with um, three black, um, two black men and a black woman in a car and driven by a wet chauffeur. That's part of the story as well. You know, that's the configuration. 
So we can use the very concrete object, a very um, well-defined object, the car, and talk about the symbolic constellation revolving uh, around that car. In the case uh, of, of, of Fitzgerald, definitely it would be a kind of a social landscape, um, the jazz age. Um, and in the case of Faulkner, it actually has to go back to the relation between the 19th century and the 20th century, right? So the horse as a relic of the 19th century being played off the automobile. So using the car, you can write a great paper that would be very specific and that would move from a small focus to a large argument. Um, so I would encourage you in writing your papers to think of similar structures, start from something extremely well defined and then move on to something larger. But in any case, um, as we can see actually, um, race, Fitzgerald was really fascinated by the relation between cause and race. So uh, it, the, it's driven by the, the, the car is memorable in here, uh, in this story, diamond as big as the wrist. Um, and it turns out that it also has a very important racial dimension. Um, we know that, um, that, that the, the, the black characters still slaves in this story, right? Um, and they were originally brought, uh, brought from the South, and they had always been in the possession of the family. So this is what happens um, to these uh, black slaves. All these Negroes are descendants of the ones my father brought north with him. They're about 250 now. You notice that they've lived so long apart from the world that the original dialect has become an almost indistinguishable patois. And he goes on to say that he actually trains um, a few of them just to speak English so that they can communicate with the, the rest of the world. But all the rest, the 250 of them, actually speak a patois or a dialect that has no relation or is so far removed from English that it would not be a recognizable language to English speakers. Um, so that in itself is almost like a little vocal um, allegory for the relation of this particular um, family and um, the Washington family um, and um, the unsustainable relation um, between today and tomorrow. You can't keep on in the middle of the United States speaking a language that is supposedly English, but really has no relation to the English spoken by everyone else. It's just not a viable way of living in the United States. Um, thinking that you're still speaking English when you was, isn't recognized as English by anyone else is not a sustainable linguistic relation. And it's also an unsustainable relation between this one closed world that wants to remain closed and the rest of the United States that is dynamically expanding and also trying to integrate all locales into a kind of national grid. So this is what happens um, when we notice that this one important aspect of the Washington family that is clearly not going to last forever. And it this Patois is not going to last forever. It's going to die out. It's going to be contaminated by the living English language. Um, that this is going to die out. What else is going to die out about the family? What else is going to die out about this particular setup, this closed world that fantasizes about being closed forever? And we see very soon that, in fact, the end is going to come faster than we think. Um, it only takes a few pages, really, for the end to arrive. Um, and it's drama on a very, 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 very large scale indeed. Simultaneously, and with an immense concussion, the chateau literally threw itself into the air, bursting into flaming fragments as it rose, and then tumbling back upon itself in a smoking pile that lay projecting half into the water of the lake. There was no fire. What smoke there was drifted off mingling with the sunshine, and for a few minutes longer, a powdering dust of marble drifted from the great featureless pile that had once been the house of jewels. There was no more sound, and the three people were alone in the valley. So the ending, in many ways, is 
not surprising. Um, it's a very interesting combination. Um, on the one hand, it's highly dramatic. On the other hand, there's an element of predictability to that drama. We always know that some catastrophe is going to happen at the end of the story. Um, and I think that Fitzgerald is actually very comfortable with that kind of uh, combination. High drama, but with almost no suspense. Um, we know almost from the very beginning that probably something very, very bad is going to happen at the end of the story. Um, so it's, uh, the, and we also know, um, just from the very desolate landscape at the end of the story, um, that the tomorrow is going to be totally different uh, from the today within the story. Um, so um, I have to confess that I like the story a lot, but I actually like drama on a smaller scale. So uh, beneath Bob's my hair, <laughs> Bob's her hair is actually my favorite story uh, among the, the, the Fitzgerald stories, um, and I hope that you. See why it's about reversion to an original type and an unknown future. So um, Fitzgerald, um, I think, really liked the story as well. So that is the story that is featured in the cover, uh, on the cover of the collection of short stories, um, Flappers and Philosophers. And um, if you guys, if the word flappers, um, if that doesn't ring a bell right away, this is an image of the very famous flappers of the 1920s, people who bob the hair and wear short skirts, shoulder legs, um, and so on. Um, so the flappers. Um, but the, so you guys know that the story is really about someone who's becoming a flapper. So Denise is going to, I mean, has, in fact, cut off all her beautiful hair, you know, tons and tons of hair. She just cut it off, has, has it cut off. Um, but it turns out that that's exactly the wrong hairdo for her. So she's very, very ugly after that. Um, and her bows stop, her bows lose all interest in her. Um, and um, she has one person to thank, her cousin. So this is what happens to the person that she has to thank. Bernice deftly amputated the other braid her cousin, Marjorie, um, is sleeping. And this is what happens to Marjorie when she's asleep. Bernice deftly amputated the other braid, paused for an instant, and then flitted swiftly and silently back to her own room. After a minute's brisk walk, she discovered that her left hand still held the two blonde braids. She laughed unexpectedly, had to shut her mouth hard to keep from emitting an absolute peal. She was passing Warren's house now, and on the impulse, she set down her baggage and swinging the braids like pieces of rope, flung them at a the wooden porch where they landed with a slight thud. She laughed again, no longer strained herself. <clears throat> she giggled wildly, scalp the selfish thing. So, I mean, you know, it really is, in one sense, no big deal. Hair will grow out, Bernice's hair will grow out, Marjorie's hair will also grow out. So cutting off somebody's braids is not like the end of the world, as it is in a diamond as big as the wrist. But still, you know, it's an interesting kind of drama. And what makes the drama especially interesting is the fact that Marjorie, that the Bernice actually uses the word scalp, which is a word not used in the, 20, in the 20th century. Uh, it goes all the way back to the 19th century, 18th century, um, has to do with Native, Native American practice. So in order to understand this odd use of language, um, I think that we need to, with the help of another sociologist um, and anthropologist, very well known, uh, one of the most important thinkers really um, in the 19th century and late 19th century, extending into the 20th century. Many authors, uh, Sir Neil Hurston actually studied with Franz Boas at Columbia. Um, so uh, Franz Boas um, had um, an interesting argument um, about human types as well. And it turns out that he is turning the notion of type on his head. And this is what he says in 1911. When, for instance, it is claimed that certain types of Europeans show better mental 
endowment and other types of Europeans, the assumption is that these types are stable and cannot undergo far-reaching changes when placed in a new social or geographical environment. An investigation of this problem shows that the assumption of an absolute stability of human types is not plausible. Okay. So Franz Bauer says that, okay, you know, it looks like on the face of it, looks like there are different types of human beings. And yes, when we look at human faces, um, you know, there really are different human types. Pretty undeniable. But he doesn't think that there's any permanence to those types. That in fact, even though you might be born into one type, uh, when you're put in a different social or geographical environment, um, you actually, that type actually gets radically modified. So it's very much an argument about the importance of environmental input and the way it can change uh, your initial genetic makeup. And to prove his point, Frank Boas actually is in, became a performance artist. Um, so this is Frank Boas dressed up as an Inuit, otherwise known as Eskimo, uh, to uh, show that yes, a Caucasian man can look just like an Inuit. And here he is, dressed up or not dressed up at all, um, as a Native American and proving that yes, a Caucasian can look like a Native American, there is no permanent social type, no permanent biological or genetic type. There's the constant shifting of boundaries among those types, as well as the possibility of put the person of one type taking on the identity of another type. So I think that that is the context for understanding uh, the very odd use of the word would scalp on the part of Venice. And it turns out that Fitzgerald has actually prepared us for that development. Much earlier in the story, when they were actually just talking about um, Venice as being totally dull and having nothing interesting to say, and just sitting around all day and doing nothing and being totally boring, um, when they were talking about her in that context, um, Marjorie actually has this interesting theory that maybe she's so dull and boring and submissive because she's just like one of the Native American women. I think it is that crazy Indian blood in Bernice, continued Marjorie. So when she was saying that, making that observation at that point, is that, that Bernice is really like the Native American women. But it turns out that, yes, she has some Indian blood in her, but what she resembles is not the Indian woman, but the Indian warrior. And that is really what's coming out in that dramatic uh, amputation of Marjorie's um, uh, braids. So the language, of course, is mock heroic. Um, it is uh, using the language of high drama to talk about something that really um, is a very small incident. But nonetheless, it's a very interesting story. And it's the only story where we don't know what the future is going to be, right? You know, that, Marge, that Bernice has done this thing um, that is out of character. We just don't know what the future will hold for her, whether she would keep on on this path, um, that this is just the beginning uh, of a new career and a new personal identity for her, or whether she would uh, revert actually back to the very quiet, very submissive uh, type that she was before. So this is the only story, I think, where we truly don't know if um, the tomorrow is going to resemble today. And I think that it has to do partly with that very unexpected reversion to an original type. Um, so the least we can say is that Fitzgerald is someone who really plays on all the possible permutations of such a type. Can't think of anybody more inventive um, or having more to bring you know, to that kind of permutation. Uh, so we're done with Fitzgerald, and uh, on Thursday we'll move on to Faulkner um, and SIA dying.